He's going to open us um, up in prayer with the Lord's Prayer today. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 The word of God says, and a child shall lead them. Amen. So I think it is befitting as we um, grow and get more children that we keep our children very active and very involved. Amen. 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 Praise God. So today, um, the Lord gave me a word. That's we it, last night, as a matter of fact. I think it was during um, our prayer meeting. And he just gave a word and it was oil. Amen. So I just stuck with oil. What I did was I went on and I just looked for songs with oil and asked the Lord to begin speaking. Amen. Okay. And then he gave the word. And I am... Praying um, through the aid of the Holy Spirit that it touches not only us, but so many people that are out there that I do believe need the word that God has given. Amen. And so we're asking now in the name of Jesus that he multiply this word, that as many people that are able to can see it and can glean what God has to say through his word. Amen. Because... God's word is so good. It's so freeing. Amen. It's free and it's freeing. Amen. And we want to make sure that as many people as possible know about the free giving of God's word, the, the free will offering that he has given of salvation. Amen. He's given us so much. And even those of us that are in church regularly, those of us that worship regularly, those of us that are rooted and grounded in the word. Sometimes there's a misnomer that when you're in church, that everything is perfect, that everything is easy, that everything is good. Amen. All the time. And God never said that to us. But what he said is that we get through it in a different way. Amen. He didn't say we get around it. He didn't say we get over it. He didn't say we crawl under it. He said we get through it. And he promised that he would never, ever, ever leave us alone. So the difference between those who are saved and those who are unsaved is that we get through the things we get through, sometimes even with a few scars, but we get through with the testimony. We get through with our salvation intact. We get through with the love of God in us and around us. We get through covered in the blood of Jesus and we get through helping other people. Amen. Mm -hmm. But the main idea is that we get through it even when it looks like we can't. Amen. Because there's some times it looks like we're going through some things that it's like, oh, my gosh, how is this going to ever come to an end? And then suddenly we're at the end. Suddenly we're at the end. Amen. We have a word to share with others. And like I said, we have a testimony. And we have another thing to praise God for and to worship him for and to testify how wonderful and almighty he is. Amen. 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 So what we are going to um, talk about, and we're going to um, have time for testimonies after this, because I want us to, everyone has a testimony. Sometimes we don't always share them, but while we're going through this, I want us to kind of think about the things that God has brought us through. Even if we're going through something right now, think about what God has brought you through and understand that whatever it is the enemy is trying his best to do right now, he has already failed. Because remember last week, we talked about the warrior inside. Amen. We've got the warrior inside of us. Amen. And so he tries, but he fails every single time. So I want us to just be thinking about what God has already done. And if we're going through something now, knowing that he's going to get through it, and maybe that's that we're going to get through, and maybe that's the testimony for today. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. So we are going to come out of the book of First Samuel today. And I'm going to read from chapter 16 in just a bit, but I want to give you an overview. So if you're um, wanting to read along with us, you can go ahead and open to First Samuel chapter 16. And you may want to grab a note sheet or something if you don't regularly have things to take notes, because I'm going to give you quite a few scriptures to look up later on. I don't want to do it through this time because I don't want to prolong the service. Um, but there's something that you can go to later, just some scriptures you can go to later on. And um, let God talk to you. Amen. So we were at a time in 1 Samuel 15 and 16 to where the people of Israel, um, well, just before that, up until this point, the people of Israel were ruled by judges. And we were in judges last week. Okay. So they were ruled by these judges. And this went on from the time of Moses to the time of Samuel. So just after Moses and Joshua, this started, and then during, through the time of Samuel. And Samuel was actually the last that was in the line of the judges. And he had appointed two sons as judges um, for his replacement, but they were corrupt and they ended up being rejected by God and also rejected by God's people. Now, the countries that were, um, around Israel at this time already had kings. And so there was a time that, you know, when one group is doing something, oftentimes other people want to jump on that bandwagon. And so the people of Israel, which were God's chosen people, asked God to give them a king. Now, God never wanted there to be a king because he wanted the people to understand that he was their king, just as he is our king, and that he was an everlasting king and will always be from the beginning to the end. And that if they just obeyed him and just followed his word and just did what he said, everything would be okay. But the people wanted a king and God gives people the desires of their hearts, but he does it according to his will. So he selected a king and he selected Saul. And we've talked about Saul before. And Saul was a very good king for quite some time, but then he got to the point where he disobeyed God. And we've seen stories like this before, where people get into a place of prosperity and they'll get into a place of um, leadership or get into a place where they've got a lot of power and they end up moving in their moving on their own even if they were um adherers to the word of god before and they were um very very staunch in their belief in god they still have gotten to a place sometimes we've seen in in people who are who have a, a big name and sometimes we can see it in in just in our local churches and that or even in our corporations or places where we work Someone may get a position and then all of a sudden they're a completely different person because they began moving in their own authority. And that's what Saul did here. So God gave him a chance. But at some point he was done with it. He was done with Saul. And he says, you know, we, I'm, I'm going to put a new king in place is, is what was happening. And so he told Samuel this. He revealed this information to Samuel and Samuel being who he was, he had gifts from God and he knew God's loyalty, but he also had a loyalty to those people that were in leadership. And so he had this, this um, affinity and this loyalty to Saul. And he really went into mourning because Saul was his authority and his leadership, his rulership was taken away. And so now we're in chapter 16. And I'm going to start in 16 and 1, and I'm going to go up to verse 13. And it reads, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord and call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint unto me him whom I name unto you. And Samuel did that which the Lord spoke and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? 
And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, all here are your children. And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And behold, he keeps the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy or red haired and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Amen. Amen. So he told Samuel right there at the beginning, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill your horn with oil. Amen. He told him, the, how long will you mourn? Fill your horn with oil. We can even make it shorter than that. How long will you mourn? Fill your horn with oil, your horn with oil and get going. Amen. Amen. And that kind of sums up that chapter. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. There are things that you've been through. Amen. Um, I, at, the, at first, when I was getting this word from God, I said, Lord, there's so much that seems like it's similar to the message from last week. And you say to give us a fresh word, to give a fresh word always. And he said, this is a fresh word. Amen. Because some, even though we heard it last week, there's someone who still needs to get the totality of this. Amen. No matter what you have gone through there, and we go through things. We go through things that cause us to mourn. Sometimes we prolong that mourning, okay? Mourning is not just when it comes to the death of someone who we've been close to, right? It's not just someone that, has, that, that we're not going to see anymore. We can mourn over the loss of a job, amen? We can mourn if, if it's something that we didn't want to leave. We can mourn over the loss of... Um, a position that we may have wanted and thought that we should get. And it, we were passed over. Even though we were qualified or overly qualified, we may have been passed over. Many of us mourn the loss of relationships, not just when someone has been widowed, you know, be, be it male or female. It's not just a widowing situation, but we've talked about divorce in the past here on this forum, that how, how in so many different ways divorce can be worse than a death because with death comes that finality. You don't have a choice but to deal with that closure. When you go through a divorce, that person is still there and you're having this to, to bring closure and to mourn something that still could be or still is and all of the what ifs come to your mind. It may not even have been a, um, a, a marriage. There are people who mourn a relationship situation. If this is the relationship you thought was supposed to lead into marriage, it may have been, but it takes two parties to cooperate with the will of God in that situation. Amen? So you may be mourning that. And there are people who have mourned a relationship and never went on to another relationship because they did. They were afraid of being hurt again. That's a real fear. It's, it's valid. You can get hurt again. But when you let God do it, he's going to take you through. And he's going to show you where you're supposed to be, whether it's a job, whether it's a, a, a relationship, whether it is someone who has gone on to glory. Amen. He will take you through. But you've got to go through that morning. You can't even say to yourself, this is just silly. 
This is silly. I shouldn't be feeling like that. If you're feeling like that, you're feeling like that. If you're crying, then there are real reasons for your tears. Don't you let anyone discount your period of mourning. Don't, every, don't let anyone, including yourself, say that it's silly and you shouldn't be feeling like this. And I've got to just buck up and be strong because mourning's going to happen either now or later. It's something that's a natural process that we go through. There was someone that I knew that had lost her daughter and she went through mourning 10 years later. When the 10 years had passed, the few people that were still around her understood what was happening. But the majority of the people that were around her had no clue as to what was going on and they weren't privy to the information that, that she had lost her daughter. And they thought that something was mentally wrong with her. They thought that, well, some thought she was just mean. Some thought that she, was, that she had a mental illness. They didn't understand she's now going through a natural process because she prolonged it. She refused to mourn. She refused to go through that grief curve, regardless of what it is. I talked about yesterday a young lady who was on American Idol at one time. And she has gone through, as she and her husband and her children have gone through a situation now where her baby was taken away from her because she sought medical help for her child. She was in a, a long story short, she was breastfeeding her baby. Um, she became pregnant again and her body given confused signals. You know, when you, when you become pregnant, your body is preparing to breastfeed. And so she was still breastfeeding one child and her body was saying, shut that, shut this down and let's make new milk. Let's start making new milk. So what happened is her breast milk started going down further and further and she had less and less. And the baby was so used to having this nourishment from his mother that he didn't want anything else. He was refusing bottles and things like that. And she and her husband were trying their best to supplement the nutrition the best that they could. So they took him to the hospital because they felt that he needed some um, liquids. He needed some kind of um, hydration. So they went, took him to the hospital. The next thing they know, CPS is there and they take their baby from them for seeking medical attention. And so she just gave birth to this new baby a week ago. And they've taken that baby away. And they've done nothing wrong. They have three other children that they never took away from them. They've done nothing wrong. This is an attack. It's something they've got to go through. These parents need to mourn what has happened. They need to go through a grief curve. They can't just say, okay, we've got to just be strong and keep moving on. No, they've gone through something. Both parents have gone through something, but this mother has had this child inside of her for nine months, felt this child grow, and now they've ripped these two babies now away from her, one less than two weeks old. And she's saying, what am I, how is, how is she, this is a girl, how is she going to eat? What is going to happen? I breastfeed my children. And so they're really going through it right now, and they need to mourn. They need to mourn the fact that their family that was once whole a few months ago, they had one little baby in their arms and now they're celebrating the fact that she's conceived again. And now all of a sudden, two members of their whole are not there anymore. They need to mourn this. It's real. It's not something that they can just say, okay, but I've got to be strong for my other children. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. No, they need to mourn. And so this is what Samuel was going through. Some people may look at him and say, why in the world are you so upset about, you know, this guy? Why are you so upset about this? Because God had given him prophetic word. And when God gives you a word and everything is not happening exactly like it was supposed to in your mind, then there's something to grieve. There's something to mourn. It's hard sometimes when you get a word from the Lord and it's not happening, especially when it involves someone else, because God's prophetic word now is um, it is contingent upon this other person cooperating. Now, make no mistake. What God has for someone is going to happen. 
It's just like with Esther, when, when Mordecai told her, listen, if you don't do this thing God has set you up for, he's already got someone, someone else in place who'll do it. So God does have someone else in place. But let's take the, the example of a, of a relationship. This person has presented themselves to you as a wonderful person, the end all be all, right? And God has said, this is your person. This is the one. And then it doesn't happen. That other person perhaps is the one that said, I, I'm, I'm not doing this. That didn't change God's will. It didn't change his will at all. And yes, he's going to have someone else waiting in the wings if we allow it. So we can't go years from now when we're alone and then say, but this was the person you said. And he says, yeah, but I sent this one and that one and this one after him and you were afraid. And you didn't ask me, is this me sending him or her? So we've got to be wary. We've got to be aware of what God is doing in our lives. And we can only do that by staying open to the Holy Spirit. So here God is telling Samuel, fill your horn with oil. Fill your horn with oil. This horn is the shofar. When God's people blow that shofar, that means it's the end of something. All right. When the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, they marched around that wall seven days in a row. And then he said, blow the shofar. Jeremiah, blow your horn. And then the walls came tumbling down. So he says, fill your horn with oil because the end of something was coming. The end of Saul's leadership was coming, coming to pass, the end of it. And God was ready to anoint a new king. Fill your horn, shofar, bringing an end to something with oil. That means he was going to anoint. Oil was there for anointing, but oil in the word of God has to do with the Holy Spirit. It is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, fill your horn with oil. There are also um, other areas where we could talk about oil, but it's symbolic primarily of the Holy Spirit. But oils were used for different things, for healings and, and that kind of thing, healings and anointings and all of these. Now, there are seven different oils in the Bible that have to do with healing. Amen. And I'm going to give you the oil in the scriptures, but I don't want to go so deep into it that we take a very, very long time. So if you'd like to jot these down, um, you can definitely do that. This, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You want to look to Exodus 30 verses 22 through 33. Now, I am going to read Exodus 30 verses 30 to 32. Exodus 30 verses 30 to 32. And it reads... And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, and they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And you shall speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. So this oil was comprised of some different oils. Um, there was, and in, in, that's in the scripture before that, so you're going to read from 22, there was myrrh, and there was cinnamon, and there was um, calamus, and there was kaja, and there was olive oil in that particular anointing oil, um, but the Holy Spirit is symbolic there. You can also look to Zechariah 4, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2, and verse 12, Zechariah 4, verse 2, and verse 12. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. Hebrews 1, verse 9. And then John chapter 2, verses 20 and 27. John chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 27. Amen. Does anyone need me to repeat any of those? Okay. Amen. So the seven healing oils that are in the Bible, the first is cedar wood. Cedar wood. Amen. And that was used for ritual cleaning. And it was used mostly in the Old Testament 
for um, lepers, those who had the, the disease of leprosy. You can find that in Leviticus 14 and 4. Leviticus 14 and 4. So it was also um, any disease. So leprosy was just a prominent disease. So they used it for diseases. Now, when we talk about diseases, we know, yeah, we've got some diseases that are out here. And we don't typically take those personally if it's not something that that um, touched us personally. Probably cancer is um, one of the most prevalent that we've most that probably many of us have been touched by in some way, shape, or form through family members. Good afternoon, Frazier. It's it's fine, brother Frazier. We have his. He said he was coming back from Edinburgh. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we are in. Um, First Samuel chapter 16, but I'm giving some verses about the seven healing oils in the, in the Bible. And we're just talking about mourning and grief and going through those things that we need to go through, be it a job, be it a person, um, be it a, re a relationship, whatever it is. If it's something that we need to grieve, something that we are crying about, something where we have tears coming from our eyes, then that means there's something to cry about. And we should not blow it off and think any less of ourselves or anyone else, but I definitely want to talk about ourselves today. We don't want to think less of ourselves because we feel like we're crying over something that other people may not cry over. That's them. Great, beautiful. That's not something that affects you, but it affects me. I'm crying and I'm going to go through my grieving period. Amen. And don't feel like it's something that you're wrong to do. Don't feel that you're weak. Don't feel that it, you're, you're silly. Don't feel like um, it's preposterous that you're doing this. It's absolutely not because we have healings in the word of God for many different situations. So we were talking about these healing oils. The first one I spoke about was cedar wood and it was for ritual cleaning. And I talked about the um, diseases. So again, amen, it's beautiful. We talked about diseases, but we can say for all intents and purposes for ourselves as individuals, instead of diseases, let's just call them diseases, something that diseases us, something that is uncomfortable to us. It may not be to someone else. Okay, that's fine. But if it is to us, it is to us. Amen. There was also cinnamon. Cinnamon was for cleansing and it was also an antiparasitic and for alter ulcers. Um, primarily stomach ulcers and stomach um, diseases and, and issues that have to do with the stomach. You can find that in Exodus 30 verses 22 through 28. So you'll see that right in the midst of the symbol for the Holy Spirit, those verses that I gave. Now, cinnamon, If when you read those scriptures, you'll see that the cinnamon was to, uh, the cinnamon oil was to anoint the things that were inside of the temple. In particular, the, the um, altar of showbread and the altar of sacrifice. Think about the altar of sacrifice. All the animals that were sacrificed on that altar, there was definitely going to be a vast amount of, of parasites and bacteria and things like that, that they may not have known all about that back then. But God in his infinite wisdom says anointed in cinnamon oil. So all of those parasites and that, that bacteria and all of those things that could grow on it, um, and do harm were cleansed and purified because we have to remember that on that altar of sacrifice, yes, the animals were sacrificed for different offerings, but the parts, some parts of the animals were for the priest for his food. So he cannot constantly say, well, the people sacrificed the animal and then the priest went back and made atonement for it. So all of these people are coming with animals from different fields and different parts of the areas with different kind of insects and everything else. And now the priest has to go and take parts of this and eat it. Where it's true, yes, a lot of the animals, the heat would have killed it off. But there are animals, although this is one that they were not supposed to eat anyway. Animals, um, the one that I always use as an example is the pig. The pig is the only animal on the planet that does not sweat. And so it's not getting rid of any toxins at all. Heat is not even killing the toxins in a pig. And so that's obviously one of the reasons the Lord said don't eat it, but um, that it was forbidden for them, even though they could now eat meat. That's one that doesn't sweat. Those, those impurities are not going anywhere. But God knew in his infinite wisdom to cleanse that um, altar 
of sacrifice. The next was frankincense. So this was a kind of catch all for them. And I laugh because over in these parts on this side of the pond, um, and I know that there's uh, there's got to be something similar for everyone on here. Robitussin is kind of a catch all medication. Um, if someone says, I've got a cough, take some Robitussin. I've got a sore th throat, take some Robitussin. You can say, we, we always kid and laugh. If someone has a backache, take Robitussin. <laughs> it's kind of a catch-all for everything. Or the, the mothers that were in the churches as we, as we grow up, the mothers were the elder um, females in the church. No matter what was going on, they're going to give you a peppermint. No matter what, get peppermint. <laughs> Just take the peppermint and it's going to cure everything. It's going to heal everything. So frankincense was kind of a catch-all for them, definitely in the Old Testament times, but they used it very frequently in New Testament times as well. Amen? Um, it's also, even today, it's used. But back then, it was used for um, inflammation and tumors, and um, they didn't know it back then. They called it getting stronger um, or something like that, but it's, it boosts the, Im the immune system even now. Amen. And that was one of the, um, the gifts that was taken to Jesus. And these gifts that were taken to him were also symbolic of preparation for his crucifixion. But that is a whole different teaching and an entirely different sermon. But you can look at that in Exodus 30 verses 34 through 36. Exodus 40 verses 34 through 36. The fourth oil is hyssop. And that's for purification, and it's also used for circulation. And that's Exodus 12, 22, Exodus 12, 22, and Psalm 51, verse 7. Psalm 51, verse 7. The next oil is balsam fir, not F-U-R, but F-I-R, like the fir tree, balsam fir. And that was used in preparing and making musical instruments, Okay. So why in the world would this have to do with healing? Because it has to do with worship. They made sure that they kept their musical instruments oiled well with the balsam fir. And they used them, like I said, when they were making them, especially with the drums and that. And our healing, when it comes to our healing, even now, worship is so key to that. Because we are self-sacrificing. We're giving all to God. We're telling him, I'm giving you everything as well. I am acknowledging you as the one who can heal. I'm acknowledging you as the only one who can do all things. I'm acknowledging you as the great and mighty I am. Amen. So there's the balsam fir, and you can find that in Isaiah 60, verse 13. Isaiah 60, verse 13, as well as 2 Samuel 6 and 5. 2 Samuel 6 and 5. Next is myrrh. Myrrh is another of the gifts that was given to the baby Christ, amen, the baby Jesus, and another that was in preparation as well, a foreshadowing of his um, preparation for burial, but that as well as an antibacterial, and it's used and was used as a daily cleansing agent. So this was one of the oils that the women had to bathe in every day for a year as, as Hadassah, who was also Esther, did when she was preparing, being prepared for the king. She had to um, bathe in that oil every day for a year. And so it was a daily cleansing agent, basically like we would use soap and, and this day and age, um, body washes and bath washes and bath bombs like you have now. So that's what uh, myrrh was used for at that time. And that's Esther 2 and 12. Esther chapter 2, verse 12. Genesis 37 and 25. Genesis 37 and 25. And then Matthew 2 and 11. Matthew 2 and 11. And finally, we get to 7. Now, Again, seven cleansing oils in the Bible. You all know me and my, my um, sensitivity to numbers in the Bible. Seven is the number of spiritual completion. So it, it, it's a process when we are healing from something, when we need to be cleansed of something, when we need God to heal us entirely. There's a completion to that. And there are seven healing oils, and it is in the number of spiritual completion. Amen? The last is myrtle. Myrtle. And myrtle was used as perfume, definitely. But myrtle is also symbolic of God's promises and the promises of his blessings. Amen. That when he says he's blessing, he is a blessing. It is a promise. 
So it's symbolic of God's promised blessings. And today it is known that myrtle also helps with thyroid issues to balance the thyroid. They wouldn't have known that back then, but you have instances in biblical times through the writings of, of those who were scholars um, and what we would call journalists now in this day and age, those writers back then talked about it being um, anointing the throat or anointing the neck with myrtle. And it's very interesting that the, it helps to balance the thyroid. And we know if our thyroid is out of whack, so many other things go awry. Our metabolism is not even right. We don't have the proper metabolism, which can also affect so many different things. It also helps with respiratory issues, breathing. We talk very often about God's ruach, breath of life, breathing in the Holy Spirit, that he created Adam. And Adam was a being, but it wasn't until God breathed into him that he became a living being when he breathed into him. So here's the myrtle that's there for respiratory issues, because oftentimes when we're going through something and we're under distress and duress, what is one of the first things that happens? We can hyperventilate. We, we breathe. We can't catch our breath. I can't breathe. Right? We talked about the oils that are there for, for circulation, because what's the next thing that happens when we're under, under duress? Our heart just beats, 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 and it needs to be regulated. All right? We may not eat or we may eat too much, in which case the thyroid needs to be balanced. And we can go on and, and you can do this individually and decipher all of these different things that take place when the that were taking place when God mandated the use of these oils for different issues and ailments. So you can find the myrtle in Zechariah 1 and 8, Zechariah 1, 8, and Nehemiah 8, 15, Nehemiah 8, 15. So now getting back to Samuel and God telling him to fill your horn with oil and go. It was going to most likely be that anointing oil, which had many of these oils encompassed in it, that it was comprised of many of these oils. God was ready to anoint a new king. He was ready to move on. Fill your horn with oil and go. So if you've been going through something and it has lasted more than a proper season, because everything God says in Ecclesiastes to everything, there is a season, a season, not season after season after season after season. That does not mean your season is two months or your season is one week or your season is six months. That's between you and God. Amen. Again, not for anybody else to tell you how you need to mourn. There was someone who told my husband um, at one point or just a couple of weeks after his mom passed away, you need to just get over it and move on. In a couple of weeks, you don't get over it in a, in a lifetime. This is someone who is his mother, the one who reared him, the one who kissed his little sores. Right. The one who put a Band-Aid on something and even something that it, it is still scratched up and bleeding. But when mom puts that Band-Aid on or dad puts that Band-Aid on it, it just kind of makes it all better. And the tears kind of dry up. Right. Mm -hmm. So he had his mom pass away and someone tells him you need to get over it and move on in a matter of a couple of weeks. That's asinine. It's absolutely ridiculous. But if you are, if, if he was still here after now eight years and he still couldn't function on a daily basis and he still couldn't breathe on a daily basis and he couldn't get out of bed on a daily basis, that means it has morphed into something else, right? But we need to fill our horns with oil and go. If we see something lasting season after season after season after season at the proper time to conclude our season of mourning, whatever that mourning is for, whatever that grief is for, we need to fill our horns with oil and go because it's time for a new, a new anointing. We can struggle with this because we all experience grief. We all experience pain. We all experience suffering. But if we're spending an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time in all of this, trying to, to, to reconcile with the fact that there's this change that has happened in our lives and we've gotten to the point where we are depressed in it, 
that this is the only thing we can talk about, no matter what the occasion, then it has become a problem. I have another friend who, um, gosh, this has been now 30, oh my, probably 35 years. She was in a relationship 35 years ago. And it started 35 years ago. And that relationship lasted formally probably three years. And here we are 32 years after that. And it is still one of the only things she can talk about. It is the most prominent thing that she speaks about. Never got married. Never moved on. Never was able to really plant herself in a career. Although she's got degrees, you know, college degrees, multiple, had formal training and a lot of other things, but she can't function. She can't do things on a daily basis because of a relationship that took place starting in high school and ended right after graduation from high school. And she stopped her life as a result of it. Yes, there was going to be pain. Yes, there was going to be some mourning. You know, that's another thing. We can't discount what people go through based on age. You know, some people write off, oh, it's just puppy love. No, if it's love to them and it's the only love that they know, then it's real and it's a big deal. If that's the biggest deal at that time. Trinity has had some breakdowns over things that at first I'm like, what in the world? The the toast got a little browner than it was supposed to. And it is catastrophic. Because in her mind at that age, it is catastrophic. We can't discount these things. Oh my gosh, that's so silly. No, because she doesn't have to deal with paying bills and she doesn't have to deal with, oh my goodness, I may lose my job. So for her, that brown ter- toast is an issue. My son called me one time at work. I was, I was teaching and I was still teaching in Detroit public schools and his school was off that day. And so, because we were in another enti- uh, school system entirely. And so his he was off that day and he called me. Now, he's old enough at this point to be able to stay in the apartment, okay? So this is, we're not talking about a baby. We're not talking about a six-year-old or a seven-year-old, okay? We're talking about someone who could stay home by themselves. And he had this, I had ordered him um, the day before, there was a play, a pizza place that we loved. And um, I ordered, it was directly across the street. I ordered him a, 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 this dinner that he liked and there was chicken there, okay? He put the chicken in the microwave and we know microwaves can do some things if you leave it in too long, okay? And so when he took them out, they were little bricks <laughs> instead of something that was edible. He calls me in my classroom and I answer the phone as usual. and. All I hear is screaming. Well, at that moment, someone has kidnapped him. He's gone from home. The place is on fire. All of these things happen at once in my mind. When I heard, I put my chicken in the microwave too long and now I can't eat it. I was apt to laugh because for me, okay, great. Nothing nothing crazy has happened. But for him, he wanted that chicken. (laughs) He had salivated over that chicken all day and all night, probably the night before, and he was ready to do this by himself. And also, it was a big deal that he was at a point where I trusted him to be in the apartment by himself. And he was getting ready to do this, I say big boy thing, he was too old to say big boy, but still, he was going to prepare a meal by himself, and it didn't work. And he was in tears. He was crying actual tears. Amen. Because that was a big deal. So when we have things that happen to us, it just depends on where we are. If we're going through something and we have no other point of reference, it's going to hit us harder than if we go through something before and we're at this place again and we know that it was taken care of before and the sun is still going to come up in the morning. It may not affect us as much, but there are some things in life that will, depending upon where we are. So I say to you the same way God said to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go. Because a new king is being crowned. A new thing in your life is being anointed. 
the Holy Spirit is coming to do something else. Now, I want to jump to that last verse that I read again, verse 13 um, of chapter 16 in 1 Samuel. And it says, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So we need to fill our horns with oil, go to that next place, see what God is anointing in our lives, what new king, so to speak, he has for us, whether it's a new relationship, whether it's a new job, whether it's a new car, because you've had this car since you were 16 years old and you named it and it is perfect. And you remember you got this little dent because you came too close to this and that dent is still there and this car has never let you down. And now all of a sudden it's on the side of the road and won't go anywhere. And they slapped a sticker on it that they're going to tow it. And I'm mourning over this vehicle and it's real, but God's got another one anointed. So fill your horn with oil and go. Amen. That job. Yes, you've been out of work a long, long time. And now you've got this job that seems like it's your dream job. Fill your horn with oil and go. Just listen to what God has for you because he's never going to leave you in something that is dreadful for you. If it's something that takes you energy every day, day in and day out to go, then you know that thing's coming to an end because God is not intended for us to be walked over, mistreated, rolled over, rolled over, disrespected or overlooked. He made us the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath if we hearken under his commandments. When I was still in Detroit Public Schools, and I've shared the story before about how it was so amazing when God told me to clean out my classroom. And I was thinking, okay, at the end of the year, I'm going. This is it. He's got something else lined up. So at the end of the school year, I'm going on to something else. And it was two days later. I ended up leaving the classroom. Three or four days later, whatever it was, I got into that car accident. And from the time he told me to clean the classroom to now, I have never stepped foot in that school again. I didn't know that it was happening then. And I certainly didn't know it was an, a, an auto accident that was going to take me out. So it didn't look like what I thought because I'm expecting a good promotion or something just magnificent to take place. And no, I flipped across the highway and it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's not what I expected. It was fill your horn with oil and go. Clean out your classroom. That was filling my horn. Blow the shofar. Go. It's time to go on to something else. And God had so many different things lined up that I never thought I'd be used to do, particularly in a situation where I had all of these ailments at that time. I didn't know, but God knew. God knew something else was about to be anointed. And when it says here that the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, David was the new king. Whatever your new king is, that God is anointing, the Holy Spirit will be on it from that day forward. The anointing will be there to do the thing that you need to do. Fill your horn with oil and go. Whatever you're grieving about, fill your horn with oil and go. If you've lost somebody and they're no longer in your life, fill your horn with oil and go. Amen. If you're at work and you're sitting at your desk, close up your briefcase, fill your horn with oil and go because God has something else. But we have to trust him. We have to believe that he knows what's best for us and he would never do anything but the best for us. He would never give us anything but his best. Because he sent his son to the cross. He didn't send his son to the cross for us to be disrespected day in and day out. But it may mean that if we're still at that job and we need to be there for another two months, but God said, yes, get ready. He means get ready because something new is about to be anointed. But it may be someone that's still there that you need to talk to about the goodness of the Lord. There may be someone there that you need to help close one more deal. And then you're on to the next. You have to finish the task at hand. Amen. And then God's got you on to the next. Just because Saul, the previous king in your life, whatever that was in your life, failed and wasn't the one that, that you thought it was going to be. David's coming. David's coming and the spirit of the Lord will be upon that new David in your life as long as you fill your horn with oil and go. Amen. 
So whatever it is that you're going through, understand oil is so symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And God promised us that he was giving us the oil of gladness, the oil of joy for our mourning. But unless we take up that horn, get ready to blow that shofar, anoint that thing, because you also know once the oil is in the horn, you still can't blow it. The thing needs to be anointed and then it's empty and you can blow the horn. And because we know that one of those healing oils was used for the instruments, it's just going to allow you to blow even louder and even stronger. And whatever walls you have in your life, just like the walls of Jericho, they're going to come tumbling down. How many times did they go around the wall of Jericho? Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six. But on that seventh day, what happened? The walls came tumbling down. Fill your horn with oil, anoint the new thing, watch the wall come tumbling down, and go. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father God, for your word. Thank you that your word heals us, that it still gives us so much strength, that it edifies us, Lord God, that you give us a fresh word, Heavenly Father. And it amazes me that you give us a fresh word from a book, Heavenly Father, that is thousands of years old, Heavenly Father, that we end up getting the text from them, Lord, from those scrolls. It ends up being translated into so many different languages, and you still give us a fresh word from it, Heavenly Father. So we ask, Lord God, that this word that you have given us today, that you do anoint it with oil for us, Heavenly Father. Let us just feel the oil pouring over us from head to toe at this point, Heavenly Father, that we are anointed afresh, Heavenly Father, that we have filled our horn with oil again for that next thing that you want us to anoint, Heavenly Father, and that whatever it is, Lord God, we know that the Spirit of the Lord will be over it over him, over her, over whatever it is from now until you come back. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. And together we say amen, amen, and amen. 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 Does anyone have any comments, any questions, anything they'd like to say, any testimonies they'd like to give? You can do so.